Life in my house had started to become twisted a few months ago. The amount of strange and psychotic incidents I dealt with seemed to grow by the day. My six-year-old daughter, Brandy, used to be a heavy sleeper before all this started. She would fall asleep on the couch while watching TV, and I would often end up carrying her to her bed. But lately, she never slept. Every time I woke up in the master bedroom, I would catch a glimpse of a small face peeking around the door, silently disappearing into the shadows of the house, unrestrained glee on her small face. My wife had the most severe personality changes of all. She wasn't the woman I had married. All of her warmth, compassion, and humanity had suddenly disappeared, leaving some monstrous shell behind. Like my daughter, she never seemed to sleep anymore. She would disappear into the dark forest behind the house at night, wandering in her nightgown, barefoot, like a pale ghost, disappearing into the mist. One night, I remember waking up from a nightmare. The bathroom light dimly illuminated the master bedroom where I slept. I turned to my wife and found her already awake, staring at me with an insane expression, her eyes bulging out of their sockets, a wide, lunatic grin spread across her face. I sat straight up in bed, my heart palpitating with fear. Is something wrong? I asked, but she continued to stare at me with that inhuman expression, her eyes gleaming. Emma, are you okay? I felt something wet and sticky soaking into my t-shirt. I looked down on the bed and saw a freshly dead possum laying between us. Its head twisted around, its torso sliced down the middle, intestines spilled out onto the sheets, staining them. The smell of blood and death hit me all at once, and I jumped out of bed without another word, grabbing new clothes and running to the bathroom. I locked myself in, hyperventilating for a few moments. Then I managed to calm myself down. I checked the lock again. Then I stripped naked and took a long shower, wiping the blood off my skin over and over. No matter how much soap I used, I still felt stained. When I was done, I opened the door a tiny crack and peered through. The bedroom looked empty. I had no idea where my wife was, and I didn't care. I quickly ran to the guest bedroom, locking the door behind me. And, for the last couple months, I slept there every night, a can of police mace on the nightstand next to the bed, a brand new deadbolt on the door. The next morning, I met my friend Richie at a local diner. I had called out sick from work, and as I sat in the booth waiting for him to arrive, my hands shook uncontrollably. I spilled coffee on the table and on myself more than a few times. I hadn't slept since the incident and was only running on a couple hours. I saw Richie arrive striding through the front door. He wore a t-shirt to show off the tattoos on his arms. With his dirty blonde hair and blue eyes, he had a very Irish cast to his face. He sat down across from me, looking me up and down quickly and frowning slightly. He saw all of the spill marks on the table, the napkins I had used to do a half-assed job of cleaning it up, my trembling hands and sunken, tired eyes. I'm sure I was quite a sight. What's up, Thorn? he asked simply, not smiling. Like a lot of my friends, he always called me by my last name, rather than by Julius. I shook my head. I don't know, man, I said. Some weird stuff has been going on. Like, really weird. I'm scared, man. I really am, he nodded. Yeah, I can tell, he said. You know I'm always here for you, whatever you need. Just call. Thanks, I said, trying to smile slightly. Now, why don't you tell me what's going on, he said. I'm all ears. Tell me everything, and maybe we can figure out something. At that moment, the waitress came, taking our orders and bringing Richie some coffee. Once she had gone, I told him everything that had happened. I didn't leave out a single detail. By the time I was done, our breakfast had arrived, and we were both on our third cups of coffee. I still felt drained, however. The caffeine seemed to make me feel more tired, if anything. Hmm, Richie said thoughtfully, eating a piece of bacon off his plate. 
He stared across the room, his eyes looking a thousand miles away, deep in thought. That is weird. I think it's more than weird, I said. It's psychotic. I'm scared to go home. I'm scared to be in the same room with my own wife and daughter. Yeah, he said, nodding, chugging the rest of his burning hot coffee in one long swallow. It is psychotic, I mean. What do you think is happening? The question caught me by surprise. I choked on my coffee, coughing. Me? I asked. I have no idea what's happening. All I know is my wife and daughter have turned into lunatics. If it was just one of them acting weird, maybe I'd think it was mental illness, schizophrenia or something. He smiled slightly at that, but his eyes remained grave. I think the seriousness with which he took the situation freaked me out nearly as much as the situation itself. But it's not one. It's both, he pointed out. And yet, not you. You seem totally fine. So what's your point? I asked. Well, if it was some sort of strange drug in the water, all three of you should be affected. You all eat and drink the same stuff, right? I nodded. And if it was mental illness, likely it would only be one of your family members affected. I mean, what are the chances that two people would develop a serious psychotic disorder at the exact same time? And schizophrenia is extremely rare in children anyways. So what does that leave? I asked. He shrugged. I don't know. Maybe buddy snatchers, aliens, mad scientists, cloning people in secret government experiments. Who the hell knows? I laughed at that. Hearing it put into words made it sound totally insane. Aliens? Body snatchers? I said, scoffing. That's all science fiction crap. This is real, man. It's real, and I don't know what to do. You should leave your house immediately. You can come stay with me for a few days, Richie said. I shook my head. I can't just leave my family behind, I said, realizing how feeble the argument sounded. I had just said these people weren't my family, after all. But Richie understood. You mean you can't leave until you find out what might have happened, he asked. My head slumped, all the tiredness and fear from the past weeks, leaving me lethargic and bone-tired. I just can't leave, I said again, feeling like a prisoner. Things began to get stranger after that. Pets began to disappear. All across the neighborhood, I would see signs for missing dogs and cats. Normally, Emma would have become despondent over this. She was an animal lover who often donated to charities for homeless or abandoned pets. She had an animal cruelty awareness sticker on her car. But, as I knew early on in my heart, it was not Emma I was living with anymore. During the first days, I thought perhaps some toxin in the food or water had caused brain damage and personality changes in my family. Maybe it was an intentional release of some chemical weapons agent by the government or a terrorist organization. All of these thoughts passed through my head, but my intuition told me over and over that they were all dead ends or red herrings. The truth was, these people were not my family. I knew it in my heart from the very beginning. I could see it in the way their eyes gleamed during the night as they crept around the house, never sleeping, moving as silently as cats stalking their prey. I would hear floorboards creak outside the door as one or maybe both of them stood there for hours on end, in the middle of the night, and my heart would begin beating fast. Dark bags began to form under my eyes as I slept less and less. The only release I had was work. But every night, I would have to come back to these people who I didn't know, but who looked identical to my family. I lost weight from the stress, and I began to smoke heavily. Normally, Emma hated it when I smoked, and she never allowed smoking in the house. Now, I chain-smoked inside, and she didn't even seem to notice. She and Brandy barely talked anymore, even to each other. When they did speak, their sentences were short, clipped, and often bizarre. A month ago, I was sitting up in the guest bed, smoking and reading some Philip K. Dick. I had the three stigmata of Palmer Eldritch in my hands, which, 
ironically, was a story about a man who had been replaced by an advanced alien civilization. It struck too close to home, and I put the book down, just staring out the window, the dim lamp I kept on through the night, giving the room a yellow glow. And then I saw her. My wife was creeping out the basement door, barefoot, an insane smile plastered across her face. Her wide eyes looked around. She looked like a maniac who was trying to keep herself from descending into uncontrollable laughter. I wonder what they find so amusing, I whispered to myself bitterly, feeling cold hatred and spite towards these two strange people who had taken over my house. I saw her start towards the woods behind the house, taking a small dirt trail that ran towards a nature reserve a mile away. And at that moment, totally fed up and ready for this madness to end, I resolved to follow her. I got up out of bed, wincing as the springs groaned. I wondered if my daughter would be waiting outside the door with a bloody knife in her hands, ready to cut me open like my wife did to that poor possum. I heard a floorboard creak directly outside my door, and a slight, barely audible sound followed it. It sounded like giggling, a little girl quietly laughing. I swore under my breath. To hell with it, I whispered, going to the window and opening it. The wood shrieked loudly, and I winced, looking back over at the door. But I heard no response from the other side. You're afraid of a little girl finding out you're leaving. A grown man, I asked myself, smiling at the absurdity of it. But when I remembered Brandy's cold, insane eyes, the smile went away. Yes, indeed, I was afraid of that little girl. I had no idea what she was capable of. I looked down. I was only on the second story, and below the window was soft earth and grass. I slowly climbed out, hanging myself down from the window and letting myself drop. I felt myself falling for a few moments, and I wondered if I would regret this. Images of my leg bone breaking and poking out through the skin ran through my head, and then I hit the ground, rolling as I hit dirt. I landed hard on my back, knocking the wind out of my lungs. I lay there for a few seconds, breathing hard, then pushed myself up and began following my wife, wearing only slippers and boxers and a t-shirt. I wasn't exactly dressed for reconnaissance work. Then again, neither was she. I glanced at the house, and from my daughter's window, I thought I saw a small face staring down at me, grinning like a jack-o'-lantern, an expression of barely contained glee and bloodlust marring her childish face. But when I looked back up, the window was empty. I figured my mind must be playing tricks on me, and yet it shook me badly. I had never imagined I could be so afraid of a little girl as I was right then. I tried to move as fast as I could without making noise, hoping I could catch up with my wife. The half moon gave some bare light that streamed through the trees. I used it to avoid the rocks and tree roots that jutted up out of the earth. After a few minutes, I heard an eerie sound coming from in front of me, humming. I caught a glimpse of my wife pale and white, her nightgown billowing around her thin frame. She stared straight ahead, her eyes not seeming to blink. She veered off the trail, and I followed from a safe distance, trying to keep myself hidden behind trees. It felt like dozens of eyes watched my every movement, but I brushed it off as paranoia. She trampled through brush and pricker bushes, not seeming to notice the thorns and whipping branches. I tried to avoid the obstacles while still keeping her in view. We went uphill for a while, and to me, her choice of direction seemed totally random. Then she stopped. The humming cut off in mid-note, and she knelt down, sighing in pleasure. She began to play with something white, laying on the ground under a small pile of leaves and brush. She carefully brushed the remnants of disintegrating leaves and soil off the object, from behind the tree, I couldn't see what it was. She ran it through her fingers, stroking it lovingly, even kissing it. After what felt like an eternity, she put it back down, turning around to start back towards the house. She passed within 20 feet of me. 
I hid behind the largest tree in the immediate area, moving behind the trunk as she passed, praying no twigs would snap and give away my presence. None did, and I watched her descend into the fog and the trees. As soon as I was sure she was gone, I crept forwards towards the spot I had seen Emma crouching. A bone lay there, thin and long, still covered in small pieces of rotting flesh. In horror, I knelt down, examining it closer. It looked too large to be an animal bone, though perhaps it could have come from a deer. Underneath, I saw the earth had recently been disturbed. It looked as if it had been dug up and filled back in. I went back to the house and grabbed a shovel from the shed, determined to solve this mystery. The dark house loomed over me, the windows looking down on me like pupils, hiding what laid behind them. When I got back to the side of the bone, I started digging. The earth was soft and fresh, and it didn't take long to get a large hole started, but I found nothing for the first half hour. Covered in sweat and breathing heavily, I took a break, then returned to the task. Once I had gotten down about five feet, I saw something besides dirt and small stones. At first, I couldn't tell what it was, but it emanated a fluorescent day-glow color. Then, with horror, I realized it was my daughter's favorite t-shirt. I kept pulling dirt off and soon found two bodies in the pit. It was Emma and Brandy, their throats cut wide open, their staring eyes covered in dirt. I turned and vomited on the forest floor, feeling I might collapse at any moment. Waves of hopelessness, confusion, and anger consumed me in turn. Staggering, I ran out of the woods, going to a neighbor's house, and frantically knocking on the door. It was 3 a.m., and it took a while to get a response. Finally, my neighbor, an old retired man, came to the door. Al, thank God, I said. His tired, bloodshot eyes looked at me for a long time. Julius, it's a bit late for a visit, he said. This is an emergency. Can I use your phone for a minute? I need the police here immediately. His eyes widened at that, and he looked wide awake a moment later. Sure, sure, come on in, he said. As soon as I had entered, he closed and locked the door behind me. He pointed towards the kitchen. Phones in there, hanging on the wall next to the door. I thanked him profusely. Visions of my murdered family members running through my head. Then I dialed the police, my fingers shaking so badly that it took me a few tries. Finally, though, I heard it begin ringing, and at that moment I wondered what exactly I would say. The 911 operator assured me that vehicles were en route and that I should stay at the house with my neighbor until they made sure the area was safe. Under no circumstances should I go outside until the police arrive. It all sounded normal and sensible at the time, and I had no suspicion that things would become nightmarish and lethal within minutes. Al had listened to me frantically, try to describe the situation to the 911 operator with wide eyes, his wrinkled old face showing fear and confusion. He had a cup of coffee in his hand, but he never drank any of it. Is that true? He asked after I hung up. Brandy and Emma are dead. You found their bodies in the forest. I nodded grimly. I hadn't told the 911 operator about the doppelgangers in the house or their bizarre and psychotic behavior. I figured once the police saw the bodies, my story would become a lot more believable. But I didn't want to sound like a lunatic over the phone lest the police come and think I was some delusional maniac who had just murdered my own wife and daughter and was trying to cover my own ass by calling and reporting it. I had watched more than enough true crime shows to know that whenever a wife or husband is murdered, their spouse is always the first suspect until cleared by forensics or an alibi. It seemed like no time passed when I heard tires screeching outside and vehicles pulling up in a frenzy. I looked outside, expecting to see police lights flashing, wondering why no sirens had sounded. My heart leaped into my throat when I saw three black SUVs filled with men in suits. They leapt out, holding automatic rifles. Without warning, they pointed the guns at the house and began firing. Fifteen dark silhouettes lined up on the street outside, 
looking like a firing squad at a military execution. When the first bullets exploded through the wall, I was so surprised that I didn't even move. I saw Al standing there with his mouth hanging open as a bullet shattered his coffee cup, sending the steaming hot black liquid all over the floor, yet missing his hand entirely. A second later, another one came in and exploded through his chest. In slow motion, I saw a flower of blood blossom out from the gaping hole that suddenly appeared in the center of his heart. He didn't so much as cry out, but instead fell back instantly, moving his hands up as if in supplication as he clenched and unclenched his fingers. His mouth opened and closed silently as a puddle of blood rapidly spread out beneath him on the linoleum kitchen floor. Then my instinct kicked in as glasses shattered and dishes exploded and light bulbs burst all around me. I jumped to the floor, crawling towards the back door, making myself as small a target as possible. At that moment, I didn't even realize I had dragged myself through the warm, sticky mess pooling beneath Al's still body. His pupils dilated in death and his mouth opened in surprise. The blood completely covered my white shirt and blue jeans. I dragged my arms and hands through it as light after light went out, each bulb exploding in turn as gunfire strafed across the house over and over, left to right, then right to left. Then, right to left, then left to right again. After what felt like an eternity, the shooting stopped. I had nearly reached the back door by this point. I also looked like a serial killer, with my clothing, shoes, and skin mostly covered by Al's blood. It made me feel sick to my stomach, and a part of me wanted to rip the soiled clothes off and throw them to the side as I went. I jumped up flinging the door open and running out into the dark night beyond. Behind me, I heard the front door smash open as the men kicked their way inside. The last thing I heard from that house was them running from room to room, yelling clear. And then I reached the border of the forest, and I was quickly swallowed up in the shadows of the trees. As I wandered blindly through the trees in mortal terror, covered in goosebumps and sweating heavily, I heard the men destroy the back door of the house. They had apparently cleared the house and realized I was no longer inside. Reality felt like a nightmare, dissociated and surreal. I couldn't believe any of this was happening, but my instincts took over, and with high amounts of adrenaline surging through my blood, I ran like I never have before. The men began to come out into the forest, sprinting, turning on bright LED lights attached to the ends of their automatic rifles. I had the advantage in that I knew these woods well. The men certainly had me beat on physical strength and stamina, though. They all looked like gym rats, their muscles bulging under their black suits, their thick bodies striding forward with purpose. They all stood tall and still for a moment as their cold killer's eyes surveyed the surroundings, reptilian and emotionless. I heard more SUVs coming to a screeching halt in front of my house, and soon the sound of many dogs barking echoed across the forest. I knew they were tracking me, and they would soon find me and kill me. No one would ever know what had happened here, lest of all me, and no one would ever be able to prevent it from happening again, with the destruction of the sole living witness to the bizarre replacement of my family. I ran towards a large rock formation I knew nearby, with small indentations allowing a man to fit in the wide cracks of the thirty-foot-tall cylinders of stone. This was a place I liked to come and sit during happier times, sometimes just meditating and listening to the sound of the birds and breathing in the clean air of the woods. Now I hoped in my time of desperation that it would come to my aid again. I heard the dogs getting closer and saw the lights separate into smaller and smaller groups as the agents combed every inch of the forest, sweeping their rifles up to down and left to right as they looked into every crevice and behind every tree. I saw a single light drawing near. My heart seemed to stop. I knelt down low, feeling the ground with my trembling fingers. 
I found a large, flat stone that must have weighed a good ten pounds. Making myself as small a target as possible, I waited for the figure to pass right by my hiding spot. Even though this happened a couple months ago now, I still remember the rising waves of anxiety that gripped my heart as this assassin stood before me. As soon as the light began turning to examine the dark corners of the indentation, I crouched in. I sprang forwards, waves of adrenaline giving me amazing strength and reflexes. The man saw me at the last moment, his eyes widening as his finger began to tighten on the trigger, and then I smashed the rock into the front of his skull. His neck twisted to the side, his eyes instantly drooping as his body went slack. I dropped the rock onto the leaf-strewn ground and caught him in the same movement, dragging his limp body back into the shallow groove of the rock where I hid. I took the automatic rifle off of him, flicking off the light and feeling around in his belt for extra magazines of ammunition. I found three extra clips. I fumbled around until I found a latch to release the magazines, unclipping them one after another and shoving them into my pockets. The man quickly started to stir, groaning and moving his head slowly from side to side, his eyes still clenched shut. Oh, he mumbled, his eyes beginning to flutter. Oh, my head, Jesus, what? His blue eyes opened suddenly and he looked directly at me, an icy hatred changing his expression in a single moment. Oh, it's you, Julius Thorne. He spat my name with venom, staring directly at me even as blood trickled down his cheeks from his forehead. Yeah, it's me, I said. What the hell is going on right now? Why did you psychopaths murder my neighbor and try to kill me? He just shook his head and kept his mouth tightly shut. I waited a few seconds, giving him a chance to answer. When I realized he wasn't planning on talking, I sighed, stealing myself for what I knew I had to do. Raising the rifle up above my head, I quickly brought the butt of the gun down into the center of his nose. I heard it crunch, a fountain of blood exploding from the front of his face. He started to open his mouth to scream, but I turned the gun around and pointed it straight at his right eye. If you scream, I'll kill you right here, I said. I have nothing to lose right now, and I'd rather go down fighting. He bit his lip so deeply that a small trickle of blood began to stream down his chin, but he didn't scream or cry out, despite the immense pain he looked to be in. Now maybe we can try this again, I said, giving him a grim smile. Why did you guys want to kill me? Why are you chasing me? We are agents who have been tasked with detecting and destroying anomalies that have arisen across the United States, he said scowling at me with hatred, his words coming out somewhat distorted as he constantly spat blood. People usually call us the cleaners. Mostly we deal with incidents in small towns, like this one, though sometimes it hits the fan in the cities too. Hell, just last week we had a werewolf in New York City. Press thought it was some serial killer who ripped apart his victims with a knife, but any coroner worth his salt would immediately be able to tell. It had actually been claws and fangs. But we found him and brought him in for containment. He had already killed three joggers and seven homeless people by then. Yeah, so what does any of that have to do with me? I asked, furious. I hated these men so badly at that moment. I had asked for help, and instead, assassins had come to my side. Your wife and daughter are dead, he replied. But you're not the first one to call and say you found the grave of your family. In every other case, the police found the people still alive and healthy in the house, and the graves totally empty by the time we got there. But there were always indications that the individuals still living had changed. They always began to show psychotic and violent behavior, and inevitably, they would kill their own family members, neighbors, hell, anyone in the area. When the anomaly is allowed to proceed, the entire town often ends up being destroyed. We lost over 10,000 people in a single incident last year. So we come in and contain it by killing anyone associated with the anomaly to stop it from spreading. Because it does spread, and it seems to 
spread by association. It starts with a couple people on a street, then the rest of their house, then their next door neighbors, and keeps going outwards like ripples spreading outwards in a pond. By this point, I heard dogs getting closer and closer and saw lights flashing through the trees in the distance, aimed in my direction. I quickly ripped a strip of fabric from the agent's shirt and tied his hands and feet before binding his mouth so he couldn't scream. I knew they would still probably find him within ten minutes or so, but that might be all I needed to get out of here. And now, at least I had a gun. I sprinted out of the woods, taking the trail in the opposite direction of the agents. I had to move in the dark, which slowed me down significantly. But I had been on these trails a thousand times before. Soon, the shouting of the men and the barking of the dogs grew faint behind me, and I came out on an empty side road. I knew the area well. Richie lived only a few blocks from here. Without thinking, I began to stagger down the road, the street lights flashing on and off above me. I saw faces peering out of windows as I passed. I must have looked like a madman being totally covered in blood with wide, panicked eyes that constantly snapped in the direction of the smallest sound. Yet amazingly, not a single person came out of their house. I wondered how many of the faces were just those who were replaced, doppelgangers with the right human skin, but without any of the human mind, except maybe for its most destructive and insane impulses. Within minutes, I found myself stumbling through Richie's front yard towards his little ranch house, a massive wraparound porch with pillars painted white in front of the light blue siding. He had Halloween decorations all over the place. A scarecrow was crucified in the front yard, fake blood streaming from its hands and feet. A massive painting of a reptilian humanoid with black shining skin and tentacles coming out of its mouth stood in front of the porch like some nightmare from an H.P. Lovecraft story. Fake gravestones were lined up, row after row of gray foam, with skeletal hands rising out from the grass in front of them. I saw plumes of smoke rising from a chimney connected to the fireplace, the smell of wood smoke and decaying autumn leaves mixing in a pleasant scent that always reminds me of Halloween. I pounded on the door until Richie came and opened it. His eyes widened as he saw me. Holy hell, Thorn, what happened? He asked. I pushed past him, looking back furtively at the street and the dark forest, stretching out before us. Hidden danger seemed to be everywhere. Close the door, I told Richie. He quickly shut it and turned the deadbolt. He turned to me, his face pale, a shocked expression on his face. Are you hurt? He asked. Whose blood is that? Is that yours? No, I said curtly, shaking my head. I don't have time to explain it all now. Some men are after me. I think they're from the government. My neighbor is dead. My family is dead. I broke down then, crying. I need help. I really, really need help right now. Okay, okay, I believe you, he said reassuringly, putting a hand on my shoulder. It's gonna be okay. That's a nice gun, by the way. He gave me a calming smile. I had nearly forgotten about the automatic rifle slung around my shoulder. I looked down at it with a blank expression, like I had just discovered a new limb on my body. Hey, how about we get you a change of clothes and then we'll figure out what to do, he said. Come with me to my room. I think you're about my size. I gratefully followed him. He gave me an old shirt and hoodie and a pair of jeans. I stripped off my bloody clothes, feeling how the drying, coagulating blood crackled under my dirt-stained fingers as I stripped. I felt a small sense of hope as I put on the clean clothes. I had my friend here with me now. I had escaped. I wasn't alone in this anymore, at least. At that moment, I heard a knock at the front door. It sounded light and hesitant, like the knocking of a small child. I walked quickly out of the room and saw Richie standing there, the front door standing wide open, a nightmarish shape standing on the porch. It looked like a person, but deep, blackened burns covered every inch of their skin. Only their eyes still had any humanity left, 
two shining pits of despair with green irises and massively dilated pupils. They constantly teared up and rolled from side to side in agony. The person held out their arms in front of them as if they were in so much pain that they didn't even want their arms to touch their body. I couldn't tell the race or gender of the person through the immense damage to their body. Yellowish fluid mixed with bright trails of blood seeped from cracks in its destroyed skin. It constantly moaned. The weeping wounds all over its body cried constantly, and the smell of smoke and gasoline radiated off the dying person on the porch. The figure grunted, Oh, God, help, please. Oh, my God, Richie said, putting his hand over his mouth. We need an ambulance here immediately. He furiously checked his pockets. Then he spun, his eyes in a blind panic. My phone's upstairs. We need to call 911 right now. No, Richie, I screamed. When I called 911, those men came and tried to kill me. They're not on our side. I wished I had more time to explain. Richie heard the note of panic in my voice. His face was covered in a sheen of sweat, and the anxiety I felt seemed reflected in his expression. Well, we have to do something, he said, a pleading tone in his voice. He looked like he wanted to turn and run away from the whole situation. Then he stopped and stared at the figure more closely. Oh, Jesus, is that you, Melissa? With those words, my heart jumped into my throat. I turned to the figure with newfound horror. Melissa and Richie had dated for nearly a year. Looking closer at the figure, I could see that it did appear to be a woman, at least as far as I could tell from the curve of the body under the blackened skin. Melissa was white and thin, about five foot six. This thing with third degree burns all over its body was certainly the right height and build. It hurts, she said, her voice gurgling and loud. Oh, it hurts so bad. Kill me. Please kill me. She waved her arms as if trying to cool them with the crisp autumn air. That's it. I'm calling an ambulance, Richie said, running past me. I followed closely behind him, leaving the door wide open. We went upstairs. He pulled his phone from its charger and opened it, dialing 911. He frowned, listening for what seemed like a long time. Then he gave me the phone. As I pressed it to my ear, I heard an emotionless message read by a robot with a woman's voice coming through. Stay in your homes until the situation is resolved. Thank you for your help in this trying time. Then it began to repeat, starting at the beginning. This is a recording. Emergency services in your area have been temporarily suspended. Help is on the way. Under Executive Order 718, martial law has been declared in your area. Until it arrives, please keep your doors locked and windows closed. Stay in your homes until the situation is resolved. What the hell is this? Richie said, infuriated. What do they mean? Emergency services are temporarily suspended. Why don't we take her straight to the hospital? I asked. His eyes brightened at this. Yeah, let's do it. What other choice do we have? She needs help immediately. She's going to die without it, he said gloomily, his eyes growing moist. But the phone says to stay inside. I really hate to say it, but I think she's going to die regardless, I said. No one can survive third degree burns over the vast majority of their body. We moved back downstairs, the phone in Richie's hand. As we came down the stairs, we saw the front door still stood open. Melissa was gone. I ran forward, seeing drops of blood and pus on the deck where she had stood. Yet there was no sign of her. Where could she have gone? She couldn't have walked far in her condition. I was amazed she was still conscious at all. She must have been in some of the worst pain imaginable. I saw a figure walking up the porch stairs. I sighed thinking Melissa had come back, and she had in a way. She stood before us now, fully healed, her clothes new and unburnt. She had an ear-to-ear -ear grin across her face, and she kept one hand behind her back. Richie, she said slowly, as if tasting the word. 
Oh, Richie, I'm so happy to see you. A lot of strange things have happened tonight. Richie's eyes glistened as tears began to slide down his face. Melissa, he said, his voice cracking. Oh my God, Melissa, it's really you, isn't it? Of course it is, baby, she said, moving a lock of blonde hair out of her face with her left hand. Her right stayed behind her back. She talked like Melissa, and she even seemed to have some of her mannerisms. But in her wide, staring eyes, there was a look of bloodlust and lunacy. Richie, stay the hell back, I said. That's not Melissa. But he ran forward, crying, his arms outstretched. I don't even know if he heard what I said. As he crossed the threshold of the door, Melissa pulled her hand from behind her back, revealing a huge, blood-stained butcher's knife. Raising it high, she ran forward, her eyes as cold as the vast, empty spaces between worlds. My hands reacted without my brain even comprehending what they were doing, raising the gun high and pointing it at her chest. I saw the knife coming down as if in slow motion, then thick drops of blood splashing in the air as bullets ripped through her stomach and heart. She jerked backwards, the knife rising back up as her arm spasmed. Stumbling, she stepped forward, futilely slashing at the air, six inches in front of Richie's neck with all of her strength, before falling face first on the porch. Richie hadn't even reacted as the knife whizzed in the air towards his body. He stood, shell-shocked and dazed, like a victim from a war zone. So did I, except with a smoking gun in my hands. Screaming began to emanate all up and down the street as people started running out of their houses. For a couple seconds, I thought everyone had simply reacted to the sound of gunshots. Perhaps some of them had even seen me kill Melissa, though if they had, they would have known my actions were clearly taken in self-defense. She still clutched the knife tightly in her right hand, her eyes bulging from their sockets, the maniacal grin eternally etched across her thin, pretty face in a grisly death mask. I quickly realized the other people on the street were not coming out to investigate gunshots, but instead running for their lives. I saw men, women and children chased by family members wielding knives, axes and guns. Across the street from Richie's house, I saw a little girl, no older than ten, running in her bright yellow SpongeBob pajamas. The mother, an overweight woman with pendulous breasts and greasy black hair, held a blood-stained samurai sword above her head, breathing heavily as she sprinted after her daughter with murder in her eyes. Under the harsh glare of the streetlights, she looked surreal, like a villain from a cartoon. Mommy, no! The girl shrieked, flailing her arms in front of her as she ran, as if she hoped an invisible guardian angel would grab her and carry her away. Daddy, help me. But I had a feeling her dad was not coming, based on the amount of blood already on the murder weapon. Richie and I began to run towards the girl, but the mother closed the distance quickly, her nightgown flying furiously around her waist. Her eyes wild, a twisted grin marring her pale face. She raised the sword, bringing it down on the back of the girl's leg. With a squeal of agony, the girl fell forwards, her pajamas quickly turning crimson with the blood streaming down her leg. She began to crawl away, weeping and shrieking for her father. Behind her, the mother raised the sword again, intending to strike the killing blow. With the girl on the ground, I had a clear shot now. I had been tempted to try to take her out earlier, but the girl had stood right between me and her mother, and I feared that I would kill them both if I fired. Now I had the mother right in my sights, the lunatic gleam in her dark eyes making her seem somehow inhuman, even alien. I squeezed the trigger, watching her head explode in a shower of hair, skin and bone splinters as a short burst of three or four bullets exploded out the end of the barrel. Her headless body stood there for a few moments, holding the bloody sword high, the neurons still firing in a body that didn't realize it had lost its life yet. She staggered forwards, falling towards her daughter, the spurting stump of her neck soaking the girl in her mother's blood. 
The girl continued to crawl away from this nightmarish figure that had once been her mother. Running forwards, Richie grabbed the girl, carefully lifting her up behind her knees and shoulders. I covered them as mayhem broke out all down the street, continuously moving the barrel of the automatic rifle in the direction of any nearby sounds, ready to fire at a moment's notice. Most of the houses were spaced a few hundred feet apart, with thick forests that stretched behind them for miles. Further down the street, I saw chaos and bloodshed as deranged family members murdered their own sons and daughters, their own mothers and fathers, littering the street with the corpses. Pain-filled screams shattered the silence of the night, echoing and distorting as they mixed into a nightmarish cacophony. Even months later, I still hear them when I'm falling asleep, the horror-filled cries of children in their last moments. We ignored the bloodshed and ran back towards the house. The girl's blood dripped all down Richie's arms. She moaned and kept rolling her head, eventually letting it settle against Richie's chest. Then she went quiet, her eyes closing, a peaceful look coming over her face. We ran through the open door. Richie took the girl into the kitchen, putting her on the table. I stayed behind, locking the door before also engaging the deadbolt. I turned around, assessing the damage. The girl's eyes stayed close as Richie took off her pajama bottoms. We both had college degrees and a great deal of theoretical knowledge on many subjects, but neither of us had any real experience in assessing or dressing wounds. I took out my phone, instinctively going to YouTube to type in how to give someone stitches, but I noticed my internet didn't work. All phone calls and text messages refused to go through. Apparently, they had taken down all cell service as well as revoking emergency services. Okay, I said, we have no internet, so we're going to have to do this blind. I don't think it's that difficult. I think you know more about this than I do, Richie said. You always loved anatomy and dissections and all that. I nodded grimly. I went and washed my hands while Richie grabbed a box of latex gloves from a kitchen drawer. I walked back to the girl and started to clean the area with paper towels, a bowl of water and a clean rag sitting next to the prone figure on the table. Soon, the water had turned a bright red as I used the rag to clean the blood off her skin. I could see the wound had not hit any vital areas. I saw no severed blood vessels spurting bright red arterial blood in time with her heartbeat, and the bleeding had already started to slow. I sighed in relief at our small bit of luck. It looks a lot worse than it is, I said. The sword cut into the muscle somewhat, but it missed all the major arteries and veins in the area. She might have a hard time walking, but I think that as long as we clean and bandage it properly, she should be fine. Assuming she gets out of here alive, Richie pointed out. I nodded. He went and grabbed a sewing kit from his living room. Something Melissa had left behind. From the garage, he got a length of fishing line. After sterilizing the needles and fishing line and cleaning the wound with alcohol, I threaded it and began to stitch the girl's skin back together. The girl still lay on the table, catatonic and pale. Richie and I sat in the living room, unsure of what to do next, waiting for her to wake up from her catatonic state. You know what I think? Richie asked. No, but I'm sure you're about to tell me, I said, glancing out the window. Richie's eyes gleamed, his hands shaking. I couldn't tell if it was terror or excitement. You know how the Bible sounds totally nuts, at least the Old Testament part where they talk about how all women came from a man's rib and how there were only two people and everyone is descended from their children's incestuous coupling. I nodded. This was a topic Richie had gone on at length about before. I knew where he was going to try to steer the conversation. I sighed, looking out the window again. Other than the dozens of bloody bodies strewn across the street, everything looked idyllic. Just another peaceful street in a small American town. Yeah? And you think it has something to do with aliens, right? I said. He nodded quickly, gesticulating crazily with his hands now. I mean, yeah, think about it. A woman coming from a man's rib. That doesn't even make sense, unless... 
he put his finger up. It was some sort of genetic engineering. Perhaps they wanted his bone marrow for its DNA. You don't need to take out someone's rib to get their DNA, I retorted. You can literally get DNA from any part of their body, except the red blood cells, of course. He looked at me quizzically. I forgot just how much you know off the top of your head sometimes, he said, shaking his head. Why not the red blood cells? Because they lose the nucleus when the progenitor cell creates them. So they have no DNA and no nucleus. I thought I saw a shadow flicker across the street, but when I turned my head, I saw just shadows. A flag waved lazily in the front yard. Well, anyways, they might have had a reason for using the bone marrow for genetic engineering. Why do you think Adam and Eve's great-grandkids weren't deformed mutants or babbling idiots? Richie asked. I don't know, you tell me, I answered. I'm assuming it's because the story is a load of bullshit. He smiled at this. Because the kids were genetically engineered, too. And probably the grandkids and so on. The aliens likely kept changing each individual's genetic code so these few people could reproduce with their own siblings without harmful effects to the children. They probably engineered all the different races, too. They made the two genders, so why not? Richie explained enthusiastically. I had to give him credit. The whole idea made sense in a weird kind of way. And another weird thing, Richie said, is that you could make a woman from a man, but not a man from a woman. To make a woman from a man's DNA, all you need to do is remove the Y chromosome and duplicate the X chromosome. Right. But you can't make a man from a woman's DNA because the Y chromosome would be entirely missing. The Y chromosome would have to be synthetically engineered from nucleotides, which would pose a huge problem, much harder than just replicating the X chromosome. There's no way the people who wrote the Bible could have known any of that. I think what's going on now is just demonic, I replied. Aliens wouldn't come all the way here just to take a random monkey and engineer it into the human species. And they wouldn't care about replacing people. What kind of sense would that make? But in hindsight, even though both of us were wrong, I think Richie was much closer to the truth. The girl woke up about 15 minutes later. I heard her moaning from the living room turning away from the window where I had kept a constant watch. I saw her rising on the table, her small face a mask of pain and confusion. Where am I? She asked. You're just across the street from your house, I said. We brought you inside. Where's my dad? She said. I just shook my head. I haven't seen any living people on the street in over 20 minutes. If your dad is alive, then he must have left. There are probably people hiding in the woods until things cool down, I replied. In truth, I thought there was no chance at all that her father was still alive. I walked over to the girl and put my hand on her shoulder. She flinched back, her dark brown hair falling over her face as she pulled away. I'm not going to hurt you, I said. My name's Julius, and my friend's name is Richie. You already know Richie, though. Right, she nodded. I've seen him a few times mowing the lawn and stuff, but I don't really know him, she responded. Well, he's one of the good guys. So am I. That's why we brought you inside and bandaged your leg. I even gave you stitches, though I don't know how professional they look. They'll do the job until we can get you to a hospital, though, I think. My name's Alice, she said, smiling, red spots rising on her pale cheeks. Thanks, I guess. But do you know... At that moment, the lights flickered. They came back to life for a moment and then died again. Ah, oh, shit, I said. Richie sprang up from the couch, navigating his way through the dark to the kitchen. I heard him shuffling through drawers, and then he pulled out two flashlights. He turned one on and then began to walk over to give me the other. No need, I said, turning the attachable light on the assault rifle on. Its LED light looked blinding, much brighter than Richie's two flashlights. He turned and gave the other to Alice. Thanks, she said shyly, turning it on. I went back to the window, deciding to check and see if there was any movement yet. With the streetlights out, I could barely see anything. 
I shone my light through the window and screamed when I saw a figure standing inches away on the other side of the window, grinning. Strange white tentacles covered the area where its eyes should have been, writhing and undulating, thick with slime and blood. Underneath it, I could see the face splitting in two as its grin spread ever wider, separating except for five inches of bone and glistening muscles at the back. Hundreds of sharp, serrated teeth gleamed in the light. Its body looked skinned, wet with blood that dripped from its bony fingers. It closed its mouth, the flesh coming together without any line or mark indicating where it had separated, and in a gurgling voice, it spoke. The experiment is nearly complete. We will keep the strong alive. In the end, you will stand alone, and to us you will return. But do not be afraid. We will make the strong eternal. Why are you doing this? I screamed, my finger tightening on the trigger. I wanted to blow apart this monstrous apparition, but something inside told me to hold my fire. I had a feeling he had not come alone, and if I began shooting, it might force them to invade the house and attack me. You have three hours left until the experiment ends, it said, turning to leave. It ignored my question. I watched the muscles on its skinless body contracting as it walked away, the huge tentacles sprouting from its head constantly writhing like snakes. I saw the alien creature walk over to the woods on the other side of the street, where two more of its kind stood waiting, both naked and skinned. A man in a black robe with a hood pulled over his face followed behind them as they disappeared into the shadows. I hadn't realized just how massive they were until a human form stood directly beside one. They towered over him, at least eight feet tall, with their tentacles stretching out far behind them. I turned to see Richie and Alice, standing horror-struck in the kitchen. They were preparing some of the perishable food by flashlight, making ham sandwiches with cheese and lettuce, drinking milk and orange juice. I sat down, grabbing a sandwich and taking a bite. Well, Richie, I said through a mouthful of sandwich, I think you're right about them experimenting on us. I don't know why or what they hope to accomplish, but something intelligent is clearly using us as guinea pigs. Did you hear what it said? What's going to happen in three hours? Is that when they plan on killing all of us, the survivors? They already wiped out most of the town, she said bitterly. They killed my mom. They killed my family too, I said, and I think we'll all be dead soon if we don't do something. We can't stay here. We have to get out of town. We have to warn people what's happening here. You said those government goons already know about it, Richie said. Who else are we going to warn? No one would believe us for a minute. I barely believe it. I felt like I had been slapped. I hadn't thought about the men in the black SUVs ever since we took Alice in. Where had they gone? Why weren't they here, tracking down people associated with the anomaly and shooting them? Unless they had abandoned the town. Perhaps it had gone too far for such measures to be of any use. Perhaps that was why they had disabled 911 by the time I got to Richie's house. A shiver of fear ran through my body as I contemplated it. What about getting revenge for Melissa and your wife, he pointed at me, and your mother, he pointed at Alice. I laughed at that. Revenge? With what? The three magazines I have left for this rifle. You guys don't even have weapons and she's just a ten-year-old girl. I want revenge just as much as anyone, but we have to focus on surviving. Most of all, we had to focus on her surviving, I said, nodding towards Alice. We're the only people left now who can help her get out of here alive. Richie was about to say something when shrieking started outside. I heard a man yelling for his life. I ran to the window and saw someone banging on Alice's house across the street. Oh, God, please help me, someone, he screamed. When no one answered, he began running towards Richie's house. I figured he had been doing this for a couple minutes. But when he saw the beam of the detachable flashlight on the gun through the front window, his eyes widened. Oh, thank God, he said. Please let me in. They're right behind me. 
I looked at the man in wonder for a long moment. Then recognition came to me. This was the agent I had ambushed in the woods. I could tell by the broken nose, the bloody mark on his forehead, the black suit he wore, and even by his cold eyes. Without thinking, I ran to the hallway and flung open the front door. Come in, I whispered, and stop yelling. You're going to attract everything in a ten-mile radius with that. And then I saw what was behind him coming up the dark street and my words caught in my throat. A dozen agents in black suits walked forward, bone-white tentacles whipping crazily around their heads. Their eyes were gone, the entire top of their head replaced by those strange alien appendages. Below it, I saw their mouths gnashing, constantly biting the air with bloody serrated teeth. They were coming in our direction. Time to go, I yelled into the house at Richie and Alice. They had been preparing backpacks of food and water. In a flash, they were out of the house, Alice gripping Richie's hand tightly as her small face contorted with fear at the sight of the agents. I had put in a fresh magazine after we got in the house. Aiming through the sights, I began to fire, my ears ringing as fire erupted from the barrel. Blood erupted from the chests and faces of the agents, their tentacles splitting apart and spewing black fluid on the pavement below. Their high-pitched, animalistic shrieks echoed off the pavement as they ran forwards in a blur. I remember seeing two of them fall, then four, then another couple stumbled as the gun clicked beneath my finger. I had gone through all thirty rounds, and it wasn't enough. Three of them still ran at us when a blinding light flashed above the trees. I heard a thwack, thwack, thwack sound, and a powerful engine roaring behind it. I looked up just in time to see a Black Hawk helicopter flying overhead. A man with a machine gun began firing, mowing down all the remaining agents in a matter of moments. He turned the gun towards those crawling on the ground, still alive, and with a flash of bullets, they stopped moving as well. Then he slowly began to turn the gun on us. I had started to reload, slamming the magazine in as fast as I could. Without thinking, I raised it, looked through the sights and fired. As if in slow motion, I saw the man above me in the helicopter jerk before falling out the side door. With a heavy thud, his body hit the lawn of Richie's house far below. The helicopter kept flying and soon disappeared over the forest, the sound of its blades receding and then disappearing within seconds. I turned to Richie, seeing his sweaty face and wide, bloodshot eyes. The agent stood behind him, his face covered in blood. Richie still held Alice's hand, and the girl had her face pressed against his chest, silently crying. We really need to get out of here, I said, looking hard at the agent. I wondered how much he knew, and how much he would tell me. Our bedraggled group, bloody and sore and injured, began walking as one towards the trail down the street. One that I knew ran through a nature reserve and came out at the next town over. And as I listened to the agent talk, I realized just how wrong I had been about everything happening in my town. 